Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. Series 6 of the Plant-Based Podcast is brought to you with the help of Vivara UK. Vivara are a team of garden wildlife experts and their mission is to make nature accessible to everyone. They provide ideas and solutions to create more wildlife habitats, from large green spaces to small urban areas. Join them at vivara.co.uk today. So what a treat we had to start the year. The amazing BBC Green Planet programme had us all glued to our screens every Sunday for the last few weeks. It's captured the attention of plant lovers of all levels and people that think they didn't like plants now love plants in the way that we already do here on the Plant Based Podcast. So I am proper excited about this one. We are so honoured to have Mike Gunton, the executive producer of BBC Green Planet, on today's podcast. So for all of you plant lovers and newbie plant lovers and wannabe plant lovers, this this is definitely the episode for you. Really excited to delve into this. Mike, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Looking forward to it. Brilliant. So please introduce yourself to us just in a nutshell, perhaps little snapshot of your career, you know, kind of taking you up to your work on the green planet, and then we'll delve into that even more. You said a nutshell. This could take some time. No, I, I've... Um, <laughs> Maybe I'm a biggish nut. Yeah. 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 We could do a coco de mer, as it's a plant-based. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> maybe not that big. No. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm, my name's Mike Gunton. I'm, um, I have two jobs. I am the creative director of the BBC Natural History Unit. And I'm also the executive producer of a number of the landmark programmes, the ones we do with David Attenborough, things like um, Planet Earth 2, Dynasties, those kind of shows, I look after those as well. Um, and I've, I've been doing this for, uh, since 1987. So what is that, 13, four years? Yeah, I've been a wildlife, wow. filmmaker, wildlife filmmaker for 34 years. I did start very young, straight out of college, I should say, quickly. <laughs> um, and... In actual fact, I was I wanted to be a, a social documentary filmmaker. I did a bit of filmmaking when I was at college and all the rest of it. And that's, that was the direction I was thought I was heading and I made a few films like that. And then, but I always wanted to work with Attenborough. I'd seen him as a as a teenager doing life on earth. And this job opportunity mm-hmm. came up on the series called Trials of Life, which was going to be his final show. I mean, this is the hour <laughs> today. And anyway, I got the chance because I'd done a some stuff with presenters. I got the chance to work on that show. Did that. I thought I'd do it for three years, then I'll move on. Did that. Never look back. Because why would you ever do anything else? I thought, you know, it was such an extraordinary thing. And of course, the the huge irony was, as everybody thought he was going to finish, here we are 34 years later, and we're still working together. Um, So it's been a great joy. Isn't that incredible? You know, I know we will chat a little bit more, of course, uh, into the filming with David Attenborough, but what an amazing career, you know, you see him as that kind of figurehead, but there you are behind the scene, just seeing all this stuff, you know, you're seeing it out in the wild, you're seeing it back in the studio. So you're experiencing all of that, you know, just the same. It's just, you're not the person in front of the camera. And uh, it's almost like you have the dream job. (laughs) Well, I think, I mean, I think I do have the dream job actually, because you don't have the pressure of being in front of the camera, which is Mm. not, it's not insignificant, but also, you know, what you say about, what you witness because one of the things I've always tried to do in the programs I've been involved in anyway is to try and use the camera and the storytelling and the editing and everything that we everything that we bring to a program to try and recreate the kind of sense and the excitement and the experience that we have had as the witnesses of what actually happens in the wild either through the lens or through our own eyes so yeah, yeah I mean, that's, sure. very much, that's very much the approach 
So tell us a little bit more about your role within the uh, BBC Green Planet then. You know, you, earlier on before we were recording, you were saying that there's kind of three different aspects that goes towards filming that final result. Mm-hmm. Can we delve a little bit more into those okay. three aspects? I think it's also worth just talking a little bit about the history because one of my jobs as the creative director is is to be kind of looking out over the horizon about what do I think is going to be the the zeitgeist, what's going to catch people's imaginations in three or four years' time? Because these these projects take sometimes five years by the time we, from the, the first moment where the little light bulb goes off and then actually gets on air. And this is a good example of that. Um, and I remember thinking, I just finished um, doing Planet Earth 2, and I was thinking about what, what sort of projects. And I had I had some others I, I had already was sort of working on, but I was thinking, <clears throat> what, you know, there have been this incredible kind of upsurge of, interest and excitement and fascination and sort of sense of fragility about the natural world as a result i think of what of making planet earth 2 it's sort of that hit a zeitgeist and i was and i had 25 years or so ago there'd been a series called private life of plants which atterbury had worked on and i'd wanted to work on that and i couldn't or didn't and it was kind of unfinished business for me i thought right mm-hmm. that i want to make that myself and and I also thought I could sense that things were there's something in the air. People were talking about about plants, about the importance of the plant world, and about um, the sense. And I can talk about it a bit later about this sense of plant blindness, blindness that people don't really understand what's going on in the plant world. And there was some fascinating scientific work about how plants communicate. And and also I remember tree hugging as a you know as a as a little child you know the sort of the hippie loving trees and communicating with trees and I thought actually there's something about that coming back so anyway I thought mm-hmm. I think there might be a zeitgeist coming that in about four or five years time plants are going to be big news so emboldened by that I came up with this idea and then managed to persuade because it's not an easy job to persuade people who have to fund these things and put them on air I want to make a landmark BBC one popular television show <coughs> on plants but I think we were able to persuade them that with the technology that I thought we could develop and the and the thinking behind it and the storytelling, and it didn't it didn't hurt. I just finished Planet Earth 2, which had been a massive success. Mm-hmm. Managed to persuade people to say, okay, we'll give it a go. And that's what we did. Well, I that's it's harder because people don't respect plants as much as animals, perhaps, because animals are always cute, they move around, they do nice things, but plants <laughs> just a lot of people think they're just there. Well, but that I mean, that's we know there's a lot more to it, of yeah. course. I mean, that's both that's both the challenge, but also what makes it such an exciting thing, and that's what actually drives the innovation, and makes it all the more satisfying when you, if as I think we, I think we have pulled it off in, in this project. And part of that thinking was actually to say, well, how would you film plants if you were filming them as animals? What was what's the sort mm-hmm. of the narrative? What's the sort of positions of the camera? What's the sort of um interactions and where, where's the conflict you know where does the drama come in, into mm. this because of course mm. you do fascination you can do oh that's interesting or that's weird but drama does needs conflict and so how do you yeah. how do you both tell that but also show that in a thing in, in organisms that for most people just sit doing nothing mm. and and that in a way was the that's the, the that's the the beauty of of doing working on this is that if you look at if you look at plants as we do through our own senses, they don't do anything. They sit there, as David says, they sit there waiting to be eaten. But mm. they actually are living in this parallel universe where mm, it's absolutely all sorts of stuff's happening, but we don't sense it. So the challenge for us was to say, right, like the Lion, the Witch of the Wardrobe, go through the wardrobe or a portal into a different timed um, space. You can go through that portal, spread the you know, part those curtains, and jump into that world. Goodness me, do you see an extraordinary thing? So that was the, that was the that was the, the 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 push that was how can we do that? How can we take people on that? And when you do, you see all that drama that you see in the yeah, war. It's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. You've really you've really brought that kind of connection Cine- to plants and the natural world. Plants, yeah, yeah exactly you know yeah. you've kind of drawn people into into their world you know and it is like it is a drama what's going on and, and people love a drama don't they right yeah, so they want, people love because they want to know who's going to win what's going to yeah. happen that you know is that x mm. going to live or die is it going to get a mate is it not going to get a mate and so how transfer transferring that kind of thinking and that kind of storytelling into the world of plants that was the sim- that was a simple mission mm. and you know and i 
again, when I was going round to our partners saying, you know, will you join us on this project? One of the simplest ways of saying it was, this is planet Earth for plants. Imagine all the techniques, yeah. all the approach, that sort of immersive getting on the shoulder of the of the protagonists and antagonists in planet Earth, which I think was the breakthrough we did and made it different from the original planet Earth. <clears throat> Let's take that thinking and, and impose it into the plant world. But you can only do that once you step through that portal into their world, into that time frame world. And that's where the technology comes in. Well, thank you so much for taking us through that portal <laughs> because, you know, it really has stirred so many people's kind of um, imagination and just helped to make that connection to that beautiful green planet that we do live on. Um, so just before we go on and go into a little bit more depth about the filming, I think most of our listeners are going to be saying, what about Attenborough? What about David Attenborough? We all love David Attenborough. And you do know what happened online, don't you, after he was rowing in the middle of oh, nowhere God. Oh. and when he lifted the camera over the side it's almost like everyone went oh but what if he fell in that was terrifying <laughs> well, it was terrifying they, everybody can rest assured that within about <laughs> 10 feet or less of him i was there so <laughs> in the rowing boat if you look very very carefully in that rowing boat there's a tarpaulin hidden under that tarpaulin I'm there. When he's <laughs> when he's lifting that camera into the water, just yeah. out of shot, holding onto the uh, holding onto the punt, the boat he's in, I'm there. So that's part of my job is to direct him on these on these projects, but also, of course, is to make sure that no no ill f- befalls him. Yeah. Is, uh, but can um, you is, swim? <laughs> I can. <laughs> Not that and I actually rode when I was at university, so I, you know, <laughs> I was, um, I, I, you know, there was a bit of competition between us actually about who could, row, who could do the, who, who was the best rower. Um, but you know, going back to David about th- this series, really, we had to become time travelers, and you, the audience, have to become time travelers to be able to understand what goes on in the plant world, and we needed somebody as a guide, somebody who is our kind of the, the the pilot of the magic carpet that takes you on this on this journey. And of course, David is that person. Of and course. you know, again, because of that, one, because of course he, he does these shows anyway, but also because of that history with private life of plants, you know, he's tro- he's slightly trodden the ground already. So it made it it made it a natural thing for him to do. But nevertheless, you know, he has a lot on his plate and I still had to work reasonably hard to no, I mean actually he was no he was very, very keen to do it. But, I, you know, I, I had to go and see him say, I want to do this. I think you'd be the right person to do it. And one of the things that we wanted to really, was important element of this, was that what he's so brilliant at, his, and has done historically, but less so more recently, because, you know, just, you know, it's hard of him to travel in the way he used to, but it's to go to places and say, look at this. Let me show you this. Let me mm. Let me poke this. Let me lift this. Let me... And that sort of interaction with the natural world on location was something that we very much wanted to do. And that was a conversation I had with him about, you know, are you happy to go, you know, get the band back together sort of thing, you know, get back on the road and go and do these trips. And yeah, I think it didn't take him long to say, yeah, actually, this this is the one to do it with. Because with plants, it's important for him to be there and showing you. But also, I, don't, I never say anything's easier, but at least the plants, you know, the, both their strength and their, they don't run away. So at least you don't have to be chasing elephants across the Serengeti or, you know, mm-hmm. out in a boat trying to find a great white shark. You know, yeah, you, true. There, <laughs> you can go there and you know it's there. So you can plan um, mm. the logistics of it a bit a bit more easily. And, and yeah, we did a lot. Of, I mean, we, we did about 30 trips, I think, 30 shoots with him, uh, 30 shoots. And a lot of them were in the overseas. And then luckily we finished most of the overseas ones we were going to do just as COVID hit. hit. Mm-hmm. And so we were kind of grounded. But luckily we'd always planned to do some in the UK. So we were able to pick those up in the second half of the of the production mm-hmm. schedule. So, yeah. Put it down. Wow. Well, um, to be honest, a moment ago when you said it, um, it kind of took about five years from the conception to the actual kind of screening. That feels quicker than I imagined it would be. So that is that's pretty good news. <laughs> it's not a long <laughs> time to us. <laughs> but the actual like conception, like how how did you start and decide which plants you were going to tell the stories of, and where you would then visit those, and how how did you get that well, kind of started? 
Well, that, that's a huge. So, so you know, it's like a, mm-hmm. like all these things. You, you know, you have your idea, then you gather your gather your allies, you gather your team, uh, mm-hmm. both the producers, the directors, the camera teams, um, and the researchers. And so it was a, it was a it was a kind of two phase. One of my colleagues came and worked with me for about six months, kind of going through all the stuff that had been filmed, plants so that people had done odd little bits hither and thither, hither and thither, okay. and see if they would give us some inspiration. Um, and uh, he started making contact with the scientific community, you know, people at the mm-hmm. Open University at Kew, people at the Botanical Gardens, and all the rest of it to try and, because part of this was about the science also was shifting. You know, the mm-hmm. scientists were also starting to look at plant behaviour rather than just, you know, plant taxonomy or plant physiology. It was mm-hmm. how do plants actually do stuff? And that, of course, is, that's what we want to film. So being able to connect with them and, so, and sort of circle round and, like a vicious circle of, I'm oh, sorry, uh, uh, not it was a vicious, the opposite, a uh, virtuous circle. Where, <laughs> yeah, where they had an idea, then they, we said, well, could you do this? Is this true? And they, oh, yes. And, you know, you sort of build up and, and you gradually start to develop mm-hmm. some really interesting stuff. And then you pull together a, a team of, I think a production team of 30 plus people who then mm-hmm. are then the team broken up into each episode has its own sort of sub team with a mm-hmm. person responsible for that team and, and a team of researchers and, and directors who, we go off and go off and do it, yeah. But then, of course, there's hundreds of other people out in the sort of greater environment, field assistants, field scientists, all those people. There's probably about a thousand people work on it over mm. the whole five years. Wow. And, um, it, you may not necessarily remember now, but were there any plants that you wanted to film that you couldn't get to or just weren't available to you? Well, um, when you're looking for, you know, the, the box office superstars in the plant mm. world, as you do with animals, um, they do have seasonality about them. They do have, some yeah. of them are very yeah. rare. Some of them have, you know, there's a, one plant we did, a fire lily, it only comes into flower once every 10 to 15 years. There's a wonderful plant called La, La Frisia, which is kind mm. of, the, which is one of the superstars. And we actually had... Um, it's the biggest flower in the world. It's a, it's called also called the corpse flower. It's a, it's a, para, it's a parasite actually. It doesn't even have a stem or a leaves. But um, anyway, we wanted to film that. But all the um, all the field experts were saying we just can't find one at the right stage because it takes yeah. a number of years for them to reach maturity before they then when they do flower they only really flower for a couple of days. So it's quite mm-hmm. the clock's ticking. Anyway, we'd given up, and then right at the eleventh hour, we heard that somebody out in the Malaysian forest have found one and or found a group of them. So we just, you know, mobilized if because once they found it and they said it's going to flower, you yeah, got yeah, of course. leading queue. So we all got out, the team got out there and we set up all our cameras because we'd only have one go at it. So it was multiple mm. cameras, time lapse cameras shooting it. And um we had one of the worst rainstorms they can remember and half the cameras were flooded out. Luckily the gods were against us on that but they were with us in that each of the cameras that all the cameras that didn't get destroyed all had the key shots. So we were able oh, to, wow. to go. So that was very fortunate. Yeah. It's a great sequence as well. Fantastic sequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh that my was, gosh. It's, that was it sounds that like wasn't a, gonna make it, but did it, in the end by more by luck. Yeah. It sounds like military precision, like proper planning for all of this, you know. But there must be things that don't quite work out. Kind of like, is there a location that you filmed at that wasn't was was really tricky or much? Yeah, more tricky well, you can track a long way to some because well, some might be quite remote that you filmed in. I guess a huge numbers of them are remote. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Places, I mean, South America was a, was a, probably the biggest challenge for us. Because um, obviously, with the, with the rainforest they have out there, fantastic plants, mm-hmm. and fantastic stories, and we had a lot in our sh- in our scripts. And um, access there to the whole of South America got very very difficult in COVID. Luckily, um, we managed to uh, we we had some relationships with some filmmakers out there, and actually we we sort of shifted our our, our kind of resources and our efforts to working with them and mm-hmm. they they were filming so they were able to film remotely in in country you know mm-hmm. working with us and then and as it turned out it was a it was a master stroke because they we hadn't worked with them that much but they were producing phenomenal quality material really, so really really cool. good and stuff and they got they got they could get to places i don't know if you remember in the water world film where there's an extraordinary river with those what what uh, they've been referred to as um Cascade lilies, they, they, uh, cascade orchids. Thing. They, they, they almost look like pink 
mm. candy floss. Yeah. yeah I'd say that's one of the most memorable things from it the is. series for me, that, because yeah. I'd never seen that plant before. Yeah. That's super remote. And, you know, so they, yeah. So so there was some, sometimes, um, what was it, the mother, catastrophe is the mother invention. You know, sometimes you're forced into mm. doing things and then actually it turns out to be a really good outcome. Yeah, mm -hmm. I tell I I absolutely love the story of the fire lily, just because yeah. you, know, you actually captured it as well. You know, like you were saying, it could be ten plus years before it it blooms. And as they were kind of trekking around trying to find it, I was thinking, are they going to find it really? But you absolutely mm. did. But what an amazing story! Because no. who would have thought that a, a, in order for a flower to bloom, it needs a fire. It it needs that kind of that horrible what we would. Uh, Say the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. So many seeds need that kind of smoke treatment, etc. Yeah. Right. It's just incredible. Yeah, it's a, it's surprising. Um, there's a huge biome of uh, of plants that need that fire are adapted mm -hmm. to respond to fire, um, and, yeah. and now you know now can only survive uh, only uh, only grow after they're stimulated by smoke or whatever it is. So, but of course they're very fragile. I mean, well, this is one of the things that has come out in the series. <laughs> You know, as well as the, you know, it's it's very much about wonder and about ex the extraordinary, crazy evolution that plants have, the path they've taken to come up with these amazing adaptations, but it's also about the, the, the these environment these eco ecosystems and these co co partnerships are mm. very very finely balanced, and actually, that makes them quite vulnerable to change or uh, you know rapid change and you know one of the things that has come out of the series we wanted to do it anyway but it's it, it's come out anyway uh about the vulnerability of the plant ecosystems and again yeah. because we're a bit plant blind we don't really think about plants we don't really notice the troubles they're in mm. and that's and that's something that we very much wanted to bring to the forefront um and we actually did a fifth episode it, it's it, we mentioned this in every single episode but the fifth episode which was originally I always wanted to do one about our relationship with plants, mm. our you know, human relationship, because I always thought the whole agriculture story, you know, who's in charge? Are we the servants of the plants, in fact? Or are they, the, you know, there's some interesting ideas in there. But actually, that turned out to be a fascinating, you know, the, the, the fingers of that, I, of that of those stories went in all sorts of directions, about, also mm. about this, this fragility of, uh, of human, dominate, human dominated plant ecosystems or, or, <laughs> monocultural ecosystems you know lots of really fascinating but also quite sobering things mm. to say about our planet because you know the green world is the foundation of all life without it we can't mm. we can't survive we can't eat we can't drink we can't breathe all these things and that that was very much driven home i hope not driven home because we don't want to driving is never a good thing in television but it was it was um brought to the surface and explained. No, I think it was the perfect balance. And in each episode, you always had a kind of environmental message somewhere, somewhere kind of two thirds of the way, wasn't it? And yeah. then obviously you're kind of showing how the cameras work. So I think it was really paced perfectly, I have to say. Oh, yeah. But um, I just want to ask a bit more about the filming because of course, yeah. when you filmed things like, you know, the Blue Planet and kind of all the different shows where animals you're filming animals that are moving you have to depend on the animals then doing something etc but with this one you're filming plants but you also were filming animals pollinating or taking the seeds off somewhere how on earth did you get both animal and plant to cooperate in that in the plant being ready at the right time and the animal being present that must have been a nightmare in itself yeah <laughs> well <laughs> yes and no i mean the, the thing is that very often those those relationships are also very tightly bonded mm. bound you know that those often those plants and those animals depend on each other for everything yeah. you know? they, and so if you know when that plant is going to be in flower you're mm. pretty sure that that you know that that pollinator is going to be around because it needs to be true, um, true. one of the things that's been tricky on the series is all those predictions about when things are going to come into flower when they're going to come mm -hmm. into leaf they're, they're getting quite tricky to pin down. Yeah. And that's so one of the other waiting in a hotel room or did someone tip <laughs> you off? How did it work? Well, I mean, a bit of both. <laughs> Obviously, you've got um, yeah. you, you, the, sci the, you know, the scientists and the naturists in the field know, you know, they're observing, they keep an eye on these things and saying, yes, yeah. it's coming into bloom. So we get the tip off. But it, but you can't, you can't mobilise very often. You can't mobilise that quickly. These have to be planned out a year in advance. So, you know, you scientist X says, Plant Y is going to be in flower 
in the mm. usually it's usually the last three weeks of May. So you say, right, that's the trip. We're going to be there in, in, in the last three weeks of May. And that gives us a bit of a bit of a window in which to get in to get those stories. But um one of the things that was when you talked about uh, timing, I, I thought you were going to mention because one of the great bits of timing, I think, in the whole series is in again in the opening episode where David's talking about a particular flower that is pollinated by a particular type of bat mm. and a very, very tight relationship. And they, they depend on each other. And the idea of that sequence was that the flat, you watch the flower um, coming into it. What it does is it flowers pretty much overnight. And so it, it, it's there as a bud and then it, overnight it opens up and then that night it'll be pollinated by the bat. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to film in time lapse the flower opening up, ready to be pollinated. So over the previous three or four hours, we had the time-lapse camera running on that, so you can see it in time-lapse. And then we wanted to go from time-lapse to real-time, so for David to walk in to that same shot, the camera locked off, mm. to deliver his piece to camera about the importance of this, um, this flower, and then say, and of course, it's pollinated by a bat. Now, on that day, the gods were honest, because he said, and of course, it's pollinated by a bat. And on cue, the bat And away. <laughs> and you can see the expression on his face. He just, he just turns to the camera and goes, you know. He's that powerful. <laughs> now, again, we knew that, that the, the bats were there. So we knew they were, you know, we'd, we'd, made, we'd, we'd made our, we'd reduced the odds because the bats were coming. We knew they were there. We'd seen them. But it was, even so, it could have easily come 30 seconds later or five yeah, minutes yeah. later, but it came bang on cue. So, yeah, there's a lot. You you make your luck by planning, but it still requires quite a bit of luck. Yeah, mm-hmm. I could definitely see that. But I love, by the way, I loved that moment when David Attenborough did turn to the camera and he kind of had a smile and everyone like melted online. Everyone was like, oh, did you see that? It was so lovely. <laughs> we were having a great time. I mean, that, and I think that we were having a great time. He was having a great time. And I think that comes across in the, you know, we're enjoying ourselves, funny, extraordinary, fascinating, yeah, totally. dramatic. And then that sort of, that filters out. I think the audience are quite, you know, they're very sophisticated in how they sense what's going on on the screen. So I, I think you get that. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Jenny. Hello, I'm Gersip. And we are Rooty Fuel. Here at Rooty Fuel, we are passionate about introducing plant-based and vegan cooking into people's lives through a supportive online cookery school. We teach you the tips and tricks from a classically trained chef, giving you kitchen confidence and making vegan food enjoyable for the whole family. Today, we're going to inspire you to make some delicious breakfasts. Why not try our overnight oats? Really simple. For two people, you need 120 grams of oats, 220 grams of almond milk and the toppings of your choice. My favourite are goji berries and nuts. Jenny, what are yours? Oh, that sounds good. I think my favourite's probably a frozen raspberry and banana mix. And then I top it with a little bit of peanut butter or almond butter on the top. Oh, simply gorgeous. I like the sound of that. Another really gorgeous cinnamon, apple and raisin swirls. This one will fill your home full of the gorgeous aroma of baking smells so it's a really lovely weekend treat this one will make about six portions six to eight portions and it's a roll of shop-bought ready rolled vegan puff pastry one apple 100 grams of raisins two tablespoons of caster sugar and one teaspoon of cinnamon we have in fact got a really super simple video on our Facebook page that you can follow just to see how we've done this and you'll want to be getting into the screen to get those cinnamon swirls out for yourself. So if you're feeling inspired and want to know more about our recipes why not follow us on our social media which is Instagram and Facebook our handle is at Rooty Fuel or why not go to our website rootyfuel.com. Thank you for having us on. Next time, we'd love you to join us. We're going to be sharing some super simple, super delicious lunches. (laughs) 
like just going back to uh, towards the beginning again, we were talking about the kind of three aspects of yeah. filming. Can you just tell us those? So how do you decide which are going to be recorded in the studio yeah. and out in the field? Well, we should probably talk about the, how we delivered this kind of this different look uh, and this, this sort of time jumping look in the time lapse um, in the studio. So because of because of the nature of this type of it's a very it's a very specific type of filmmaking when you're pl- filming plants. So it, it involves notwithstanding the David bits, which we've kind of talked about, but it's you 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 need to film in the field. You need to film out in the out in the jungles, out in the mountains, and you, you, you film as much as you possibly can there. But the the detail of some of the time lapse you, it's very very hard to do that because the conditions are so variable. Yeah, you can't you just can't get it. You just won't get any images. So what we do is what we have to do is for those we have to perfectly recreate that ecology in in the in a controlled environment, uh, which is a posh way of saying basically an old barn in Devon, which is mm. uh, <laughs> which is the lair of this genius time lapse photographer called Tim Shepard who who has been doing this well certainly since t- private life of plants but has you know it's it is it, his absolute metier but um but he and we felt we for this series we wanted to take it onto another stage and there are two things we wanted to do one was as I was t- saying earlier we wanted to get that sense of both protagonist and you know all the characters in it now in a normal time lapse you have to put you have your you build your a perfect ecology, which and again, that in itself is is very horticulturally very challenging. Because if anything goes wrong, we all know how difficult it is to keep plants alive. You know? yeah, so yeah, everything yeah. has to be everything has to be right. The humidity, the temperature, the other plants that are with it, the water, all those things have to be perfect. Um, but anyway, you, so if you're going to sh- shoot your scene, you know you have your camera and it's in in position and it's basically static and it just films and the the plants move in that frame, which is fine. But you can't really get a sense of anything, any dynamism, any relationship. What we wanted to do is to say, well, okay, well, that plant's moving towards that one that she's going to either attack or or, (coughs) beat or whatever. You want to see the other plant from its perspective. So you have to put have a camera on that. But you can't put a camera on that because if you did, it would be in the same shot as the first camera. Mm -hmm. So the only way you can do that is by moving the camera around the around the environment and that is the challenge there is it's okay to move it once but when you need to move it back again to pick up the next frame of the time lapse of your first plant if it's slightly out of position it'll look horrible so the engineering what it was is basically a hyper engineering and computer controlled task and we one of our producers who's a bit of an internet geek he spends his time sort of surfing cool photography on the on the on the internet and he discovered this guy you know living in america who is a was a a, an engineer who worked in telecoms and on various other things was a bit of a computer geek but also was obsessed with filming plants because he'd been inspired by the original Mm -hmm. private life of plants and he had been building these amazing computer controlled rigs so anyway we got together we brought him over we got our engineers working with him and together came up with this extraordinary rig called which we nicknamed Otto which allowed us to in a studio move the camera all around the set and keep coming back to the so it would be taking a shot of you and then it would take a shot of somebody else and then but it come back to you in exactly the right position so you get this this sense of juxtaposition of the creatures and the way we described it was I don't know if you remember um the film Rocky when the final in the in the when he finally in the ring and you see the shots and you see the the, the camera gets the shot of the, the fist hitting him in the face. Then it's a shot of the POV of his face. Then it's a shot of his opponent on his shoulder. Then it's the referee. Then it's the crowd. Then it's the top shot. Oh, that's what we wanted to recreate, that sense of all this dynamism. We, in fact, we called it the, we called it the Rocky Balboa sequences. <laughs> and, and, those, and, that, so that was that, and that's what I think when you're talking about that drama, those are those shots. Mm. Now, the real trick was then, could we ever do that out in the field? And that's when we created the Triffid, which was a field transportable version of that, which allowed us to go and do that out in the out in the wilds, which is the army ants, sorry, the um, leaf cutter ant sequence we did, where mm. we tracked along a whole column of of uh, leaf cutter ants from the from where they eat the leaves all the way along this. Yeah, path. that was amazing. <laughs> but the the last thing to say about that, and I think it's the final sort of um, killer, is that. 
what's happening in the frame, what you're seeing in the frame is in time lapse, but the camera is in our world. So the tracking camera is moving as if we were moving. So it's as if we were walking along that branch, looking at mm -hmm. this, but what's going on in our eyes is in time lapse. And that's the real portal. That's the jump into the, into their world in the ultimate way, I think, which nobody's ever been able to do before. It's like quantum leaping or something. <laughs> it, it, it is a bit of a mind bender. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, hopefully, when the audience see it, they they know it's they know it's something extraordinary, but they're not going. Mm. It doesn't threat. You know, you've got to be yeah, careful. Yeah. You don't have that uncanny valley type sensation. But I, I think it was okay. Oh, well, it I, a... I think it was definitely okay. I think it was yeah. more than okay. <laughs> Well, it was a bit of a long description, but it is quite complicated, but, uh, especially as I can't show you anything. And, you know, normally I'm pointing at things, but to try and paint it. No, as well, no, no. Heavily got it. It must have been a relief when you got to the filming in the UK that was a bit more simple, where you're just sitting there getting a squirting cucumber to go off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although, but again, that was another, that was a hilarious moment where you, know, you get the phone call, the cucumbers are about to blow, <laughs> which is not a, thing, not a phrase you hear very often. And, uh, yeah, of anyway, course, you must have lots of those. <laughs> yeah, so you, and again, you're scrambling and out there to make sure you get there in time for mm. them. And they're pumped up just the right. That was another <laughs> lovely David moment because he he he. It's, I mean, he knew he knew the story, and I think he probably yeah. knew one in the past. But they they was they were so perfectly primed. Yeah, just, I know when they go yellow at the end and they're ready to go, and I've, I I ping them with my fingers, and it really hurts like an elastic band yeah. on your finger. It's like I can see why you used a stick. <laughs> but just um going back on what you said earlier because obviously we saw the victoria the big water lily kind of growing in captivity but there were some plants you wouldn't have had that option with surely because the rafflesia yeah right, that exactly. couldn't be rein reinstated like that could it so impossible to do in the in, nobody, nobody's ever done it nobody's no yeah there, there, yeah there's a whole uh, <clears throat> group of plants that are which are not even Q can grow them in captivity. Mm. So, no, you, mm. you you have to pick your, and that's, you know, you were, you were asking me earlier about how you pick your subjects, you know, how you cast your your your, your shows. And, you know, mm. that's one of the factors, you know, is it, is yeah. it actually of course. Is it something that you can actually, in terms of, you know, anything's filmable if you spend enough time and enough money, but is it practical to be able to film it? And, you know, that, that's another filter that you have to pass through. Mm, okay and can you tell us a bit more with the kind of thinking on the because the environmental message I think was so well balanced and I think for some people that were starting to watch the show they probably thought it would be a big environmental message all throughout being like a sermon and it really didn't have that feel about it it told you very plainly about plants and then there was always that section in the middle what was some of the thought process with that because I think it made it very digestible for people personally yeah. Well, I'm glad um, that's really good to hear because I, I mean, you know, there's no doubt that we, that as as wildlife filmmakers, we have a kind of responsibility because most, you know, huge numbers of people only really get to see nature through our programs inevitably because they, they live very urban lives and all the rest of it. So, you know, we we do think quite hard about what's the story we're telling about nature because you want to show people wonder, you want to show people the beauty, the complexity, the the amazingness of all this of all these adaptations mm. but equally you don't want to paint too uh, too uh, an, un an unrealistic picture that all is well with the world because you know, yeah. there are definitely challenges so getting that balance right and interestingly we i felt that with plants what was interesting about some of the the messaging is so much about the environment is stop doing this, don't do this, don't do that, don't do, mm. you know, don't use plastic, yeah. don't use but with plants, some of the messaging is more like do, you know, plant something, nurture something. Yeah. And because the, the thing you're dealing with is a living thing, you can never do anything, you could never do any of this with an animal. It would be ethically unacceptable. With a plant, you can. So mm -hmm. that sort of that sort of ethos shift meant that I think that imposed that that. That that sort of created the parameters under which we would the sorts of stories we would try to tell in a more mm -hmm. nurturing, more positive way. And interestingly, David, I think about a couple of years ago, said he was when he was working on this, he was enjoying it because he'd said, you know, I've spent a lot of time telling people about and rightly about some of the the challenges and the bleak 
some of the bleaker things of that. And it's rather nice to be able to tell people about some hopeful things. And we, so yeah. I think we, we're not, we're not trying to, we're not trying to be, uh, is the expression Pollyannish or whatever? I, there's an expression. We're not, we're not hiding from the, the tough realities, but we're also, when there are positive stories, they do seem to be particularly appropriate when you're talking about the plant world, partly because, of the, you know, as we demonstrated, they, you don't have to do much. Leave them alone, and mm. they'll do a huge amount for you. Yeah. you know? They'll yeah, grow yeah, back. Yeah. They'll capture all that carbon. They'll, you know, they do all the, they do stuff. And you know, we, we, one of the things I was very keen to keep saying is they're our greatest and most ancient allies. You know, we we let that line comes in quite a few times because I think it's, it's trying to rebase that relationship with plants that we, that we have and should have, because they, um, yeah. That they'll look after us in the end. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I think what you said earlier on is key to it. At the end of the day, without plants, we can't eat, drink, or breathe without them. And I think <sighs> the the show Green Planet did give some hope. And I do often find that people by nature tend to uh, respond better when there's a hopeful message course, rather than a yeah, continuously totally. bleak message because people become overwhelmed and they switch off from it because they don't know what to do about it so it's too much <laughs> um, and when you can give a little bit of hope I think that sometimes that stirs something up inside well, humans you know what you said there about what, what can we do about it I mean that's one of the biggest challenges I think in this is ever swinging pendulum that you know, and if 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 there's a, any criticism about not telling people enough about some of the the bleak some of the, the problems, if you do tell them about the problems, then there's there's an extra challenge where they say, well, oh my god, that's terrible. What can I do? What can I do? And if you can't give them any concrete or guide them, then there's a, yeah. a, an extra frustration. So there's nothing. It's not easy. None of this is easy. Otherwise, it would we'd all be doing it. But the idea is to I think try to find a way of giving people reality checks and also and also sometimes I think stirring people's passions up a bit about the injustice of some of these things or the you know what's it doesn't feel right that this should be happening to these poor defenseless animals or plants um but also then giving people some kind of outlet whereby they can feel that they can make they can do something make some kind yeah. of difference and you know we're around the green planet we've got this halo um initiative which is called our green planet which allows people to if they want to they can go onto that site onto those sites and and see find out a bit more about what we what about the biology a bit more about the botany a bit more about the, the filming all the all the sort of extra questions you might like to ask but also it's trying to direct people to conservation efforts and giving them information about how they can help in that sort of way so mm-hmm. i think it's um it, it, this, this is probably the way forward. That the, the TV show is the kind of the, the, the maypole, the, the tent pole at the beginning, which draws people's interest and attention. Mm-hmm. And then you give, then you deliver sort of a supporting content and, act, and activity around it, which people can do at their leisure if they do, if they want to, or they don't want to. But at least it gives them mm. somewhere to. Oh, totally. To I have to say, you know, obviously I'm a plantsman through and through, but my plant blind partner. <laughs> was really excited to watch Green Planet every week and did not even look at his phone during the TV program. And I think that is a real win, you know. Yeah, that is a total that win. A win. Yes, yes, I do agree. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure well. that there's very many people who've done that. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says um, a lot. I, um, my, my, I come from. I am. I let this family down. I. My come from. I come from a family of plants people my grandfather my father mm-hmm. and my sister or my grandfather was had a nursery as a plantsman my father was a lecturer in horticulture my sister's a lecturer in horticulture i really let the side down so this is my effort to <laughs> I do something about plants you're no longer the black sheep <laughs> <laughs> So just before we wrap up for this episode, we do have a, a little surprise quiz coming up for you shortly, oh, Mike. <laughs> oh, I, I, I never, it's funny, we, we have one at our local, the, uh, we're all members of the, the supporters of the local zoo here, and they, every year we have a, a dinner, and they always have a, a an animal-based quiz, and I always say, everybody says, Mike, come on my team, I always do appallingly. Oh, well, don't worry, it's not animal based. No, it's no. more of a fun, quick fire round. Yeah. So you have I'm to pretty, answer I, immediately. I'm pretty sure you're going to be just fine with this one. Um, <laughs> but just before we do, the very last thing I'd love to ask you is for you personally, was there a moment during all of the years that you were filming that was particularly memorable? Um, 
for any reason, for fun or for, I don't know, was there a yeah. moment that you just will never forget? Uh, can I have two? Okay, yeah, Ooh. sure. The first one, the first <laughs> one was, there. Yeah. <laughs> the first one was standing in the Sequoia National Park with those giant sequoias doing the opening for the series and seeing you know, there's an overused expression, it's awe-inspiring, but seeing something that would genuinely major... I, I've been to places like Antarctica where you feel microscopic, but you, you stand by those trees and you feel microscopic, not just in terms of your size, but in terms of your life. Because yeah. these things have been there for 3,000 years. They're the fastest growing yeah. things on the planet. They are just genuinely... And, and I, I think this is an important part of one of the last little things I wanted to do in, in my little list of things for this series. It was a little little box to tick was spiritual. I think there's something yeah. very spiritual about our relationship with plants. I wanted to, to try and get a little bit of that in there. And I felt that very much when I was with those sequoias. So that was mm -hmm. extraordinary. And then the other one, I think, was just because it was a great Attenborough moment. And probably the last time I will go into the wilds with him was when we went up to the Arctic Circle to do the piece with the uh, in, in Northern Finland, the opening of the seasonal film in all that snow. And mm -hmm. it was just a great moment. We had, you know, we, we had a lot of time to chat about stuff we'd done and all the rest of it. And it was mm -hmm. a really lovely moment of kind of turning, you know, putting, yeah. the was finished, putting the full stop in and just chatting to him in the, right, around this little fire in a hut, minus 20 outside, just talking about things we'd done. So that was, oh, a, that was a wonderful moment. <laughs> yeah. Sure. That. Well, we're going to move into this little quick fire quiz now. So you need to answer super quick. First thing that comes into your mind. Okay. There's only 10 questions. Ellen and I will alternate and I will kick off with what is your favorite season? Open brackets in the UK, close brackets. Spring. <laughs> cool. What's your, what's your favorite color? Red. What's your favorite food? S sea bass with, with, um, um, what's that herb? Oh God. It's the, uh, dill. No, it's another one. The very free, uh, it doesn't matter. There's a lovely herb that you put in the top. When I come back at the end of the question, I'll think. I want to know. Rosemary. <laughs> rosemary. Di rosemary. <laughs> rosemary. There you go. Who is your hero? Who was my hero or is Who my is hero? your hero? Um, Bobby Moore. Hey, Bobby what Moore. is your go to lazy dinner? Uh, Marks and Spencer's do a fantastic aubergine bake with which comes with triple triple fried chips. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I expect Marks are available. Now deliver that every day for the, every week. A, I'm probably not allowed to do that actually working with the BBC. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, what's your favourite thing to do in autumn? Um, uh, make a make a make a uh, wooden fire. Uh -huh. Is your bed made right now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you could afford any car, which one would you drive? Um, a Shelby Cobra. Oh. Uh -huh. And if you could be transformed into one animal, which one would you choose? Uh, Tasm um, a um, Himalayan wolf. <laughs> it's a okay. very cool wolf. It's a wolf that is a wolf, but doesn't take itself too seriously, which I think is <laughs> <laughs> And Ellen's I got the final that. question. This is the final question, and this actually makes me laugh. These are set like 10 questions that we're asking all guests of the series. <laughs> Have you ever gone viral online? Um, well, I think yes, because Ooh. when we did the penguin dance um yeah. for, for um for this series i i don't know if it i don't know what viral means nowadays i mean i, I just think it's about 20 million people but a lot of people have picked up that the penguin dance and there's three of us there's sir david um patrick who's the doctor and me standing in a, up to our sort of waists in a, or thighs in a snowdrift trying to do the what the <laughs> the sammy people do to keep warm which is the the so-called penguin dance. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I'm oh. pretty sure that you've definitely gone viral. So the answer <laughs> is most definitely yes. If not for that, but for all the other things that have gone on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it has been such a pleasure chatting with you. And I think overall, 
personally and i'm sure for michael too i just really want to thank you for doing what you do yeah. because i know you clearly love your job and you're super passionate about it but bringing plants and the animal kingdom you know to the screen so that everybody can enjoy it and immerse themselves in it and understand it a bit better and the fragility of it um, and how important they are to us is exceptional and i'm mm. i'm genuinely very thankful that you've you've done that well, you're very welcome. It's, it's both a privilege and a pleasure to do it. I love it. It's a you know, it's a fantastic thing to be to be able to do to be given the chance to do it is a great is a great joy. Thank you. And we yeah. also feel like it's an absolute privilege to have you here on the podcast. Yeah, and I know definitely. our listeners will have yeah. really enjoyed this episode. So thank you so very much. Yeah, a pleasure. Hey guys, my name is Jason and I am a cloud gardener. <laughs> You're probably wondering, what is a cloud gardener? Well, basically, I have an 18th floor balcony garden. I started it in March 2020. It just kind of started off with one marigold. Throughout lockdown, like most people, I began to really appreciate my own outside space. And so my garden kind of turned into a mini project for me, just to keep my mind active. Up until that point, I never knew the benefits of gardening to mental health. As somebody with anxiety and depression, I found great solace in my little balcony garden because it was somewhere that I could go out and work and kind of forget about everything that was going on and all of the rush of the annoying voices that anxiety brings for the one or two hours a day that I'm out there working it's just silence and it gives me time to reorder my thoughts and realign myself in a positive way. In my first year I focused on self-sufficiency and growing loads and loads of veg and in my second year last year we had a really awful spring and I ended up letting some of my veg go to seed and for the first time I found a boom in wildlife on my balcony garden. For example, not only did I have my own population of hoverflies that pollinate my garden for me, and although I've never seen a butterfly up this high, I do have a population of moths on my garden. In fact, their caterpillars munched their way through my garden <laughs> at the end of last year. But I was also able to document several types of bees visiting my garden. One bumblebee, who I called Tracy, she would come and visit me every day around about the same time. But balcony gardening is not easy. And there isn't much in the way of resources for balcony gardeners online. So I decided to create my own. I started my YouTube channel and my Instagram and all those other social media platforms just to kind of pass on some of the knowledge that I'd picked up. For instance, there are some varieties of plants that I absolutely love, but the reality is, is I just can't grow them. For example, one of the main problems with balcony gardens is the wind. And one of my favourite flowers are giant sunflowers. But the leaves on those plants are so big that they kind of act like a parachute. And, and if you're not careful, they end up blowing halfway down your balcony. <laughs> or you can stake them and in strong wind, they will snap. So instead, what I have to do is grow different varieties of sunflowers that are slightly more compact and bushy which I've had to grow to love. Now, this leads me to my top tip for this month. Here in the UK, we're just about to go through two storms, which for a balcony garden is absolutely disastrous. And so to combat the weather, what I normally try to do is I will grab all of my containers and put them into one area together. And I'll put them in what I call a penguin huddle. <laughs> So I put everything together and that kind of acts as a windbreaker. In addition to my balcony garden, I've also got 150 houseplants. 
some rare, some not so rare, but it also really helps my mental health to wake up every day and kind of have a routine to sort out my house plants, but also my balcony garden. Now, if there's one thing about me is on my social media content, I try to keep everything real. So you're not going to find any picture perfect plants on my page or in my videos. Um, I'll show you my brown crispy leaves, my disrespectful calatheas, <coughs> and my ongoing battles against trying to grow a string of disappointments, sorry, a string of pearls. Because I think it's really important for people to see just how difficult houseplant care can be at times. And that is not always as easy as what you might see online. In fact, on my latest houseplant tour, I share that although I've got this large collection and it normally helps with my mental health, this year I kind of felt incredibly overwhelmed by my collection. And what became a passion of mine kind of became the complete opposite. But something clicked in me and I finally found the strength to go and do what I needed to do and, and fix my collection. So if there's anyone listening in and you're kind of in the same position, I just want you to know, don't worry, it's not going to stay like that. Eventually, you will bounce back and so will your plants. So remember, don't give up on yourself and don't give up on your plants. Hopefully, I'll see you again soon. Bye. Serious Sticks of the Plant-Based Podcast was brought to you with the help of Vivara UK. Vivara are a team of garden wildlife experts and their mission is to make nature accessible to absolutely everyone. They provide plenty of ideas and solutions which can help you to create more wildlife habitats and that's in large green spaces or even small urban areas. Why not go and join them at vivara.co.uk? We're here in the gossip section. It's the gossip section of a very special episode because we've actually been talking to the executive producer from BBC Green Planet program. So we're kind of botany crazy in this episode. We're really, really honoured and lucky to have got an interview with this guy. So very, very happy about that. But we've also got quite a big gun in our gossip section as well because we've got Paul Gelatelli. Did I pronounce that right, Paul? Close. Uh, gladly. Gelatiny, gelatiny. Oh, that sounds like galactic. <laughs> <laughs> and he's known on Instagram as the Tattooed Gardener. He actually asked to come on the podcast, and we always love that initiative when someone does that. So here he is in the gossip. We're going to talk to him, gossip about stuff, find out who he really is, what he's up to, what he's up to next, and also find out about the TV program that he's been on as well. So welcome to our gossip part of the podcast, which is, it can end up as carnage, doesn't it, Ellen? <laughs> <laughs> that was a very nice, long, in-depth intro, Michael. I've got oh. to say, I think that that was probably the most professional gossip intro that we've ever yeah? had. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's always different with a guest. So anyway, <laughs> hey Paul, how you doing? I'm great. How are you guys doing? Yeah, good. Um, I'm in UK. Ellen's in America, so she's below you. And you're in Canada, I believe, in Toronto. Uh, yeah. I'm in Toronto. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Hmm. The wonders of Zoom. We can be in three different countries. Three different countries at the same time. All we wouldn't. Different times. Yeah, we we literally <laughs> wouldn't have done this two years ago, would we? We would have only assumed that you could chat with somebody who lived know, closer to home. So I love mm. that. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I think let's find out a little bit more about you. So mm. tell our listeners who you are, um, what you do, and what it's like in Canada at the moment. Tell us all about it. Uh, it's starting to get a little warmer, which is exciting. Uh, I am known as the Tattooed Gardener. So I actually have uh, social media posts reach uh, 15 million people a month now. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are starting to check my stuff, my stuff out. Uh, I am on an upcoming episode of Visionary Gardeners. And that's pretty exciting. It's a new television program uh, that comes out on March the 7th. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, following about 8 or 10 people that are considered Visionary Gardeners. And I was sort of lucky to be considered one of them. 
Uh, so they did an episode around me and Daylily or Hemerocallus hybridizing. So mm -hmm. I have 38 registrations to my name and I did a couple of classes and taught people how to do it basically in my garden and they videoed that. Uh, so it's, it's sort of exciting just to pass on, you know, the, the passion of plants. And I think whether it's indoor plants or outdoor plants, whatever that hook is that sort of gets people, uh, it's a great world. And it's, you know, pretty awesome to be surrounded by plants all the time. Uh, so, you know, it's, it was great. I spoke at Landscape Ontario this week for their plant symposium. Uh, they had over 600 people registered for that. Uh, so it's, it's exciting. There's lots of lots of good stuff happening up here for sure. I'm clapping in the background here because I just love what you said about visionary gardeners, you know, mm. I, that we, we, I haven't seen anything like that before on the TV, like following yeah, yeah, real people, you know, who are passionate about plants and then spreading like that love and knowledge as well. That's, that sounds amazing. And I can't wait to see it out there somewhere. Uh, where will it, what will it be on? How yeah, people... it's on, it's on Vision TV, uh, mm -hmm. Vision Television, uh, but it will be available on their website the day after it airs. So okay. my episode is actually on March the 21st. So it will mm -hmm. be online on the 22nd. And I'll be sure to post on my, uh, as long as it's good, uh, I'll be sure to post, <laughs> I know it'll be good, um, I'll be sure to post it on my social media. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I'm sure it will be really amazing. <laughs> we should, we can watch that worldwide. Do you yes, think? yep. Yeah, it'll be on. It'll be on the uh, on the world wide web, so everyone should. Oh, oh, oh that's, that's awesome! Cool, yeah. Well, basically, really I nice. hope if the format is as good as it sounds, that the UK media take a bit of a hint. You know, mm -hmm. it's time for some new gardening stuff in the UK. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I think that's, totally. and I think that's what it is, right? Is there's a sort of a new generation of plant parents, and, yeah. and they're doing mm -hmm. things differently. They're connecting yeah. to oh, plants totally. differently than the generation before them and, and before us sort of thing. So yeah, I yeah, think it's, it's yeah. really tapping into that, you know, and connecting with this new generation who are plant collectors. Yeah. You know, people, are, people are spending thousands of dollars on a single leaf um, no. where my parents would have killed someone if they did something like that. <laughs> um, it, it, it just wouldn't have happened. Uh, so, you know, it's sort of, it's as a horticulturist, it sort of warms the heart, right? You're sort of like, okay, there's there's hope here. There's, you know, people yeah. buy really, really cool plants and they're learning everything about them. And, and social media helps that, right? We yeah. can sort of share that with people and connect with people like we've never been able to before. You know, the three yeah. of us are in three totally. different countries. Totally. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, so I think that that's the exciting part. Oh, definitely. Okay. These expensive plants, though. Like, I am not a good enough grower to ever buy an expensive plant like that. It's just... Oh I, I, I I would have said the same thing, but I've spent about $3,000 on... Um, <laughs> I know, isn't that awful? Uh, what, on a philodendron, on a, a philodendron firebird. Oh, okay. Oh it's stunning. I mean, it, it was... They're amazing. Fun. It's like a I dream know. plant. Oh. Right? Oh, but so I would it's sort I, of one I, of those I forget about it or yeah. it never came across my plate and it was one of my top wish list plants. So when yeah. it came to auction, I wasn't letting it go. And you know, there was me and a doctor in Vancouver, and we were bidding like crazy. And at three thousand dollars, he right? sort of went, right. It's yours. That's the one. <laughs> wow. yeah. And is it still yeah. alive? <laughs> I'll show you. Just one. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly oh. now about to see the most expensive plant we've ever seen on the podcast. <laughs> Here it is. Oh my god, I it just is. wouldn't. Yeah. Is that it's making so... you sweat, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> it's because my problem is I go away too often and I'm not like you then can't really look after your house plants in the right way. That's the, the Lachusa pot. It's self watering. Yeah. No. It's yeah. like, it takes a month before I have to water it again. So you can go away for a month and not have to worry about it. That's, mm, I've never used um, La Souza indoors, actually. They're awesome. They're awesome. Yeah. Yeah, totally, yeah. totally a fan. I'm a, I'm a new fan. I haven't used them before, but I'm mm. loving them. I've uh, switched over quite a few of my, my higher end plants. Uh -huh. Nice. That's Just really for that extra cool special care. Well, that's yeah, really exciting. I, it is yeah. a it's a beautiful plant, and when the foliage gets bigger and more, I mean, it's going to be stunning. Mm. I know, but look, and, and it's put on it's put on two or three leaves since I've had it now. So, I mean, I have eight hundred plants in my collection. <laughs> oh, that's so oh. nice. What about that for a house plant, huh? I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> It's just a winter aconite as a house no. plant. <laughs> At this like, point, I'll take you know? anything. 
you can enjoy it for as long as a bunch of flowers. So why not? You know, right. so. absolutely. That'll be out in our gardens actually here within a couple of weeks. We should have those starting to, to pop. Yeah, up. Uh, yeah, we've got them already, which is cool. And snowdrops. It feels like yeah. now at this time of year, everything kind of snowballs, and then suddenly you've got daffodils, tulips, and then you know you you look up again, and then suddenly it's the middle of summer, and you've got petunias. It's like right. Yeah. I know. It's like sometimes and, and we're, you behind, you, we're behind you. Okay. So you know, we we always look at you in England and go, oh, I wish we had that weather. Um, um, and Vancouver, you know, to the west is is there now. You know, they're also yeah. having theirs. We're a few weeks away still. But I think that we're sort of in the middle of the two. So I'm in North Carolina and we I've seen snowdrops and some very, very, very early daffodils but and some snowdrops. But I think we're just a little bit behind the UK at the moment. But next week, the weather is heating up. So everything will just spring into action really, really mm. fast here. I can't wait. I love, I love it. Yeah. Everyone's the world comes the- alive again. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's got their knickers in a twist about a potential storm here tomorrow. So, yeah. Yeah, well, there was one last night. My bamboos were everywhere, but I just tend to leave them down until I know the storms are finished. Right. <laughs> my neighbours must think my garden's carnage constantly, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a wildlife haven. That's what it is. I know, definitely. Paul, <laughs> cool, can you tell me a bit more about your career? Because I first came across you when I was um, I was speaking at Niagara Parks, uh, and Charles Hunter, who's a good friend of mine, had kind of arranged it and. I went to Toronto Botanic Garden, I think, for the afternoon, and you were joining there the week after. And I kind of thought to myself, oh, I'd really like to speak here. I must stalk this guy on social media. And that's what I did. So that was how I started following you, Paul. But you still haven't booked me. <laughs> Tell me about your career, because I know you're not at the garden anymore. But I'm not. Um, I've, I've, had, I've had a long and winding path in horticulture. Yeah. And I think that's, um, you know... It we has can see that when we Google you. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, I only got into the industry, per se, about nine years ago. Um, oh, really? I have no no formal education in horticulture, um, oh, but I've been a lifelong horticulturist. Um, at mm-hmm. 16 years old, I was a director of the Waterloo Horticultural Society. So, you know, it was me and all the 60, 70 and 80 year olds, um, mm-hmm. which is where the information came from and the education came from are people who were lifelong gardeners. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, about eight years ago, I started at a garden center and very quickly worked my way up. And uh I managed the plant collection at the Toronto Zoo as the curatorial mm-hmm. gardener. Uh, and the Toronto Zoo has one of Canada's largest tropical plant collections. Mm-hmm. So that's when I really sunk my teeth into the tropicals. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I, I went and became director of horticulture at the Toronto Botanical Garden. And and now I'm off. I'm actually opening up a boutique plant shop in Toronto. Oh, uh, wow. called the Botanical Collection. So yeah. that's, that's super exciting. We're going to be in Yorkville in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've got a business partner who is also a plant collector, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, she's got some beautiful stuff. So between her and I, we're going to take on Toronto and uh, and open a new shop. Wow, wow. that's cool. That's open. Yeah, it's exciting. I th- I, we're hoping to open this spring. Uh, we're just looking yeah. for a location that works. So right now we're actually online. Uh, yeah. So on Facebook, if you look up the Botanical Collection, you'll be able to see what we're doing. Uh-huh. Uh, and I also, cool. Yeah, I also work with BC Rare Tropical Plants, and they import plants from all over the world and basically connect plant parents with those unicorn plants, those plants that they've, they've been looking for and having a hard time unicorn with. Unicorn plants, I love the that. Unicorn probably. plants, yeah. So that's, that's sort of exciting is, is, you know, when you can give someone a plant they've been looking for and having yeah. a hard time finding, that's joy. Right there, right? Uh-huh. Like if you can, if you, you know, you see how many posts they do and every time a leaf opens up and an Instagram page is, is you mm-hmm. know, posted. I love that. I just think that's awesome. <laughs> I think um, we're, like the last, uh, last week we've done the first part of a careers in horticulture episode. Mm. And next week yeah, is yeah, the yeah. second half. And I think that this is absolutely like spot on to say that you've just told us your reach on social media. <laughs> you've just been, you, you've just filmed this visionary gardener TV show you've worked in horticulture uh, but you don't have any formal qualifications but clearly you are knowledgeable and likable you know and you've talked at shows and everything else so I think it's really important for listeners you know with regards to careers in horticulture to say that you really can pave your own way in the industry you know Mm. you can make it happen you don't even have to have the formal qualifications because you are proof of that you don't. And and I mean, it's not to, to put that formal education down in any way. I just yeah. think that there are 
other ways to go. And I think I was an yeah. employment counselor, so I actually helped people find jobs for 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was working with adults with disabilities and I was working with people just out of jail and things like that. And, you know, I woke up one day and went, what am I doing? You know, I, I don't love what I'm doing anymore. I wasn't passionate about it. Right. And I took my own advice and I said, what do I love doing? You know, and I was always afraid to go into horticulture because it was my passion and because I loved it so much. It was an escape for me from the real world. And I thought, you know, if I do this as a career, am I still going to have that passion or am I going to lose it? And, and that's why I sort of shunned away from joining the industry per se. And then once I did, it was the opposite. You know, that passion just grew and it fueled where I was going and the people I was meeting. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've been on podcasts and magazines and books and newspapers. And, you know, it's just sort of, if you love it and you believe you love it, then do it. You know, it, uh, totally. the industry will open for you. That's, that's sort of, you know, the best advice I had going into it is just do what you love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny. I don't know. Um, I don't know if like I've got a national diploma from college, which is two years, but I don't think that is really a formal qualification. So you know, I'm I'm deliciously underqualified as well. I think Ellen, actually, because you've got an RHS certificate. I wonder if you're actually more horticulturally qualified than me, officially. Which is scary. That's really scary. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you probably are, because I've kind of learned through doing. And a lot of my work has been marketing more than kind of the real practical side of it. So In theory, yeah. in theory, yes. But at the end yeah. of the day, it does come down to the experience and practical knowledge. Like you can learn all the theory you want, but if you're not putting that into action, yeah. you probably yeah. won't even retain the information you learn on the on a course. You know, you need to be out there doing it. And I think no, none more so than gardening, you know, because working mm -hmm. with plants in the outdoor world are constantly mm -hmm. changing, you know, new technologies, you know, even new, <coughs> excuse me, new new names for plants new discoveries mm -hmm. i mean everything evolves so fast so if you have had a formal qualification many years ago and that can give you really good grounding of course mm -hmm. i'm definitely not dissing formal qualifications um, but if you haven't i don't think you should ever let that stop you from moving into yeah. the yeah, yeah, yeah. horticulture yeah. industry for sure yeah, totally. I, mean, I, I tell people all the time that i kill plants constantly and people are mortified they're like yeah. the tattooed gardener kills plants yes and i love it i love killing a plant i mean if yeah. i if i if i really like that plant i'll get it again and i'll yeah. do something oh, different totally. and i'll figure it out and i'll you know and yeah. if i don't it just made space for something new and i think yeah. that's you know plants die they do it's part of what we oh, do totally. um, and, also, and, like, and not to be afraid of that and i think so many but, people are so afraid of killing a plant Mm. And, you know, if you buy a $5 plant and it dies, it was a $5 plant. You know, when you get up to buying a $5,000 plant, yeah. you're going to do whatever you can to make sure that plant is happy. And that's when you're going to learn. Yeah. You're going to research. You're going to, oh my God, the leaf is turning brown. Why? That's when you learn. That's when you sort of dig into the meats and bones of horticulture and go, But I think people okay. are really, I think people are really dumb because they, especially houseplant lovers, they kind of wonder why their houseplant dies or it isn't happy. But... They weren't bred to be houseplants. No. Hello? No, exactly. <laughs> Why does you ever think of that? So if it dies or it's not happy, then it's probably not your fault. You know, your That's house right. is not a bloody rainforest, is it? You know? It's <laughs> very easy for us to say this, though, because we know because we work with plants for so long. Yeah. Someone new wouldn't know. Like, uh, one that of my uh, very good friends, has, uh, she had a Kalanchoe, and yeah. it died off. It was looking really poorly. She put it on a windowsill, and she said, I don't know what to do. It looks really unwell. What should I do with it? And I to bin it and she says I can't bin it it's a plant I was like I know but you need to bin it because yeah. it was probably like emotionally a, attached a to a three pound plant you know yeah. and also it's never going to come back to its former glory because yeah. of where it was it's on one stem it's looking all like yucky it's just not yeah. ever going to be the same people see it she's, as a challenge to keep it alive he's insisting on keeping this a lot alive and yeah. it's got a little bit bigger as in taller but it's still it's rubbish it doesn't look anything like the Kalanchoe should look and every time I go around she says look at me look my plant's getting better and I'm like no bin it <laughs> uh, oh my god, god <laughs> but i think that's an english thing i don't know what what do you think about that paul like in canada are people as emotionally attached oh, to their parents? absolutely absolutely they really? are um, yeah. they're, they're they're kids like these are these are our kids these things uh, and, you know it's um i think i think that's true though of, of new plant parents and and you know people who are sort of brand new is they don't want to kill it you know they've posted mm -hmm. photos of it and they're excited about it and mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, for me, my plants barely 
make it through the winter inside. They do not mm. like it. Um, mm. But I put mine all out, or for the most part, outside, spring to fall, because Mother Nature takes care of them better than I do. And and she always will. Um, you know, and then they come back and they flower and they look beautiful. And then they come back inside and they go, and, you know, they started, they look a little rough. Um, but I bought a tent this year. You know, my grow tent has been a game changer for me. Um, uh -huh. I, well, like a greenhouse within your house. Yeah, yeah, of, uh, of sort, sort of like a, yeah. So it's got lights and, and keeps humidity in and, mm -hmm. you know, it's five feet by five feet by six feet. So it's a good mm -hmm. size. Um, but the tropical plants have changed astronomically. For yeah. me. You know, I'm getting anthuriums that are putting out new leaves and mm -hmm. I, cause I'm mimicking what their natural environment is, mm -hmm. which really is humidity. At yeah. the end of the day, it's yeah. that's the biggest issue that we have in our houses is our furnaces mm. are drying up our air. I think my skin needs humidity as well, you know. Absolutely. Well, that's why I look so good because I'm in the. <laughs> but right? it gets, so it's the same. It's the it same sort of thing. I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. So really, for me, I think that's the key. In the winter, is humidity and mm -hmm. light. You know, and not watering too much. Yeah, I, de I definitely have a few house plants that are struggling a bit now, but I think it won't be long before they can get a bit of fresh air and sunlight and rainwater outside for sure. Like I put quite a lot of mine outside as uh. well. Um, and we're definitely not short of humidity in North Carolina for most of spring and summer. So <laughs> they're very happy in that. Yeah. <laughs> But um, where do you do your? Are you still breeding the daylilies these days? I am. I, I've actually. You do that? Yeah, in the fall, my landlord actually sold my house in the fall, so I had to dig up my entire garden of ten years, uh, and I've moved into a condo, which I'm not crazy about, to be honest. Um, but you know, most of Toronto is little boxes in the sky. That's most people live in condos. That's just you know yeah, fact yeah. here. Um, so in some ways, I'm sort of embracing my little box in the sky as connecting to a different audience in mm -hmm. plants. Uh, but when I did, I moved all of my daylilies to a daylily farm uh, about an hour from here. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's got acres and acres and acres of daylilies. And he just, he messaged me and he's like, I saw your story. He's like, I'll dig you up six or seven beds, bring them down. So oh, all cool. of my daylilies are down there. Uh, and I'm actually yeah. going to do some hybridizing classes from there this year. Uh, and take people down there to show them how to do it. And uh, so I'm still doing it. I'm still in that game. It's uh, going to be a little tougher not having them out my front door. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, daylilies last a day. So if mm -hmm. I'm not there basically every day during flowering season, I'm not getting my hybridizing done. Uh, yeah. So it's it's going to be a, a trek for a few weeks. Um, but I mean, I'm I'm sort of working my way through the industry and uh, setting my own my own path. You know, I've, I've mm -hmm. you know I started on other people's paths, and now my path is is heading off on its own so that's cool. Have uh, you had that, some come commercially then i uh, you know i don't know i don't know if, if that's a goal of mine or not um mm -hmm. i don't like tissue culture i'm not a fan um i don't like what it does to plants i don't like what it does mm -hmm. to the industry uh, i know there are benefits don't get me wrong um but as far as going to market you have to mass produce you have to tissue culture a plant in order to have the volume to mm -hmm. put it out there uh, and then I think when you do that, your plant goes from having a value of $250 to having a value of $5. Mm. Uh, and my daylily, all of my introductions are still sold at about $200 a plant. Mm. So although I may not have 50 of them, um, the five or six or seven or 10 people that have them, they know mm -hmm. they're special. And, yeah. and to me, they're special. Uh, mm. So I, I think it's just, you know, I've I've named... Gay Lilies for Monty Dawn. Uh, I have one for Marjorie Harris, who is a, a garden author here in Canada. Um, those are special. Uh, you know, Jan Arden, Michael Bublé. I've done a Canadian musician series as well. Uh, so they're, they're more intimate, I guess, for me. And I think when you mass produce and go to market, it, you lose some of that. Mm, yeah. Ellen, you should be here tomorrow. I'm doing some hellebore breeding down oh, yeah. at Chris Wiley's nursery because my, when I joined Thompson & Morgan, the mail order company in the UK, one of my first jobs was to pollinate verbascums and I haven't done any pollinating since then when I was 18. So I'm going to have a little go tomorrow. Are you going to gonna have the paintbrush? Are you going to get your it, paintbrush? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put on your so, outfit, you cool. just go out in your little bee outfit and and fly around. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm really <laughs> um, I want to ask a question actually um, about Canada, not Tim Hortons. Um, Tim Hortons, their burgers are nice, but I'm not into the breakfast, just so you know. <laughs> um, Canadian Gardening TV, where is it at? Is it good? Is it not? What can be done? <laughs> it isn't. 
there, there's very, very little on mm. television anymore. Um, you know, I, I grew up watching the Victory Garden with my dad. I grew up watching Canadian Gardener. You know, there was a there was great shows. That was Saturday or Sunday morning. A couple of solid hours were spent watching gardening television. Mm -hmm. um, I think with the way everything has gone with the internet, and you know, everyone can watch a million different things. They can have their own shows. They can have podcasts. They can have all sorts of things. I just think that the new generation isn't connecting via television. And I mm. think maybe that's part of the reason that it's not going towards new shows and, and this and that. Having said that, this Visionary Gardeners series is brand new. Uh, mm. You know, eight episodes. It's a documentary series. Yeah, that um, sounds like more than just a how-to gardening yeah, program, which is perhaps what it needs to be, something more intelligent. Yeah. Yeah, and just, and just you know, I think people want to connect with people. And I think, you know, if you look at the gardeners themselves as opposed to what they're doing, you're, you're going to connect to somebody. And I mm -hmm. think that's, you know, if uh, I don't garden perfectly, I don't, you know, I make mistakes, I do all of that, but that's real. And I think that's what, you know, people want to see. I would love to see a new gardening series come on. You know, I think that there should be, you know, even if it's an on online series, people mm. want to know how to do things. And, and I think if you can, I, I'm going to say this expression, dumb it down, but that's not what I mean. Uh, but just make it more commonplace, you know, explain yeah, yeah, yeah. what those three things in the fertilizer numbers mean. Because mm. most people are confused by that, you know, well, so. Um, hmm. Well, the other day, Ellen, you found a gardening show in US. Tell us about it. It looked a bit trippy. Oh my gosh, it was so fun. I just like, I was just flicking through the channels and happened to stumble across a gardening show. And um, it's an, it's, they've won Emmys for this gardening show. It's two female presenters who basically are interviewing people kind of on Zoom at the moment. But pre that, it would be out and about doing, uh, you know, videotapes around in nurseries and at gardens and interviewing people. But it was just so real. Uh, that's the only way I can describe it. They were talking to people who love camellias, uh, n not necessarily someone that's um, a breeder or anything, but someone who has a large collection of camellias and loves them. So they're having this really like chilled um down to earth chat about camellias and then they were talking about the bees that pollinate and they were just it was just so down to earth and it just felt yeah. i felt so much more connected with it and it looked trippy that's funny because i think it was probably just the shots of the tv but they were wearing flower crowns for fun because they'd been talking about um peonies and it was just it was just so, it was just fun it was it was kind of just you felt more connected to it. Like I watch very few gardening shows because quite frankly, they pee me off. Yeah, we think they're so snobby. Yeah, and I can't watch them because they're not, they're for people that have got more money. They've got a lot of land. Um, the language that's used sometimes isn't really appropriate for a, a vast audience out there. Not everyone I know. I know lots of people and love them and their shows are popular. You know? Yeah, but then yeah. there's this whole other brigade of gardeners and there isn't any media catering for them. But this show, and I said, I was so happy. Like I was watching it going, this, is, this made me feel good. So yeah, I mean, we, I think we often chat about uh, gardening in the media, don't we? On the podcast, it comes up every now and again, doesn't it? And we always have a good mm -hmm. bash at it. But it's interesting to hear that it's actually the same um, in Canada and uh, other places as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's an absolutely. We make our own content now. That's mm. it. Yeah, I mean, when I when I joined the botanical garden, I I you know I said we've got to include this next generation. We've got to connect with these people because if we don't. It ends mm -hmm. with that generation. Yeah. Um, and and they, well, well, how do we do that? And I said, invite them to the table. You know, I said, bring them here. <laughs> and, and you know, they were all sort of like, well, what does that mean? I had, you know, I did a fundraising auction, basically my first year there. With COVID, you know, we were a charity. We didn't have a lot of money coming in. So we did a charity auction. And I, I reached out to all these Instagram plant collectives around Toronto. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of people running little businesses from their kitchens or their living rooms or their bedroom, wherever. They all donated, even though they hadn't ever been, you know, and they were so excited to have been invited to the table or doing something with the botanical garden. Mm -hmm. And to me, botanical gardens were always that sort of snooty, 
upper echelon, formal mm-hmm. rose garden type people that were there. And and it doesn't have to be that way. And, and I think that's, we're at a sort of a precipice where things are flipping over. You know, that older generation, mm-hmm. they're, they're getting either, you know, they're downsizing, they're moving into condos, they're leaving their gardens. And our generation can't afford, in Toronto anyways, to buy those houses. We can't. The average house is over a million dollars in Toronto. Um, so we need to come with that precipice and go, okay, now what? And, and I think that's the exciting part about now, is, is sort of meshing those two and figuring out how to do that. Very good. I uh, quite agree. I think we've just put the horticultural media to rights, haven't we? Uh-huh. <laughs> it is the gospel. We're always, <laughs> and we're always like, oh, this needs to be done, this needs to be done. But actually... I think we're doing it already and everything we do day to day is actually doing it. So I don't, we always think, oh, there's all these aims, things to aim for, but actually we're, we're doing it. So yeah, we're all doing well. Well done, everyone. <laughs> <Suck yourself on laughs> the- <laughs> well done, everyone. But well, Paul, thanks- honestly, yeah. why are the hash browns at Tim Hortons not as good as McDonald's? I don't know. It's there's a simple absolutely- thing to get no, right. I love McDonald's hash browns. Like McDonald's hash browns are like, the breakfast king. But if Tim Hortons got it right, they would win the UK. They really would. They actually have made new ones. You might like no, their... I'm not having it. I, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I have to agree with you. I can't, I can't argue with that. It, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the podcast and having a good old gossip. This was a proper good old gossip, wasn't it? <laughs> we appreciate it. Where can listeners find you online? Uh, online, you can find me as the Tattooed Gardener. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter, even though I don't really know how to use it. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, I'm a twit when it comes to Twitter. I've just, <laughs> I, I have one, but I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, mostly on Facebook. That's, that's Facebook yeah. is my main platform. Uh, I also have a website, thetattooedgardener.ca, mm-hmm. and uh, look for me there. I mean, you can see all the breeding there as well, all the varieties you've made of the day. Yeah, days. I've got to update it, but I've got most of them on there. That's cool. Awesome. And thank you guys both for having me. This was fun. Oh, it's no a worries. pleasure. And we will uh, keep our eye out for the TV show. Want to look at you breeding uh, Hemerocallis. Uh, it's Absolutely. great. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thanks thank for your you. time. Oh, Take no care. Worries. Thank you all. See you later. See you later. The music for the Bump Ace podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James. And our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi Echo. Mm-hmm.